Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening for a really cool uh, HIDMED chat. Tonight, we're going to talk about um, crisis in the heartland, and we're going to be welcoming the punk rock farmer, one of our hood medicine partners, to talk with us about how the pandemic has um, affected rural communities. Uh, my name is Dr. Nisi Hudson. I'm the chair and science director of hood medicine. And my name is Jonathan White. I am the director of policy for hood medicine initiative. Hood medicine initiative is a public health collective of um, scientists, hackers, physicians, and other assorted geeks who are dedicated to protecting black and brown lives um, throughout the pandemic and beyond. Yeah, and our Hood Medicine Chats or Hood Med Chats are our signature event. Uh, it's an effort to bring expertise of healthcare professionals and others to those communities. Our goal is very simple, let's help us save us. And tonight, you guys, we're so excited. <laughs> We have the punk rock farmer here, Jonathan Lawler. He's the founder of um, one of our partners, Brandywine, Brandywine Creek Farms in Greenfield, Indiana. Um, he and uh, his wife, Amanda, transitioned their farm from like a for-profit enterprise to a nonprofit operation in 2016. And now they produce over half a million pounds of fresh produce for food banks, food pantries, and community centers um, all over the state. But he also um, is passionate and committed to uplifting um, Black innovation and, and agriculture and um, uh, venerating all the great Black farmers from history um, and also in going out and helping uh, Black farmers sort of set their farms up and installing urban farms for people. And he's passionate about promoting ag STEM um, initiatives in uh, minority communities so that we can start training black people, black and brown people to sort of um, grow the food that, learn to grow the food that we eat, right? And, and, um, and expand sort of the pool of, of food producers in this country. So um, Jonathan, we're excited to have you with us this evening. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. It's always to... nice to have two Jonathans in the building, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Well, if yeah. you want to distinguish, I have to like admit, finally confess that ever since the first time that we met with you with our board, <laughs> we have affectionately referred to you as Malcolm Tex. <laughs> it was just like when we first met with you, and we're just like blown away, like like by how, how much of a renegade you are, you know, in everything that you do. And I guess I want you to like, tell us a little bit about um, like just your background and how that started. Uh, well, I mean, I was a farm. We were just uh, normal, like pro we were scaled produce farmers. Um, my son came home from school and said that there was a food pantry at a school, which is weird because it's not a, it's a, it's a rural school. So like, you know how you go to most schools and you see trophies with, you know, basketball or football, they had tractors and pigs and cows, you know, where they won awards. They had cattle on campus to teach animal husbandry. But there was a food crisis there. There, there, there were people that, that had, had no access to food. Um, so me and my wife started researching hunger and fresh, Food, fresh produce, nutritious food um, was not something we've seen a lot of food banks offering. Uh, I was actually told by a, a reporter that a lot of food banks in the United States now offer some type of produce based on our lead to that, that we, we set the message out there so much um, nationally that people need to, they need access to fresh, healthy food. Um, that that has changed, uh, but that was in 2016. Since then, we've distributed 4.6 million pounds of fresh produce, 300,000 pounds of protein, something like that. Uh, and we're going to keep going. We're going to keep doing it. So, uh, yeah. And I don't ask permission to do these things. I just, that, that, <laughs> I just do it. You know, I, I get. I often will get the response. Well, somebody, so and so is already doing this. I'm like, oh, are they? Okay. Doesn't look like it to me. I have lots of people coming to me for help, so I'm not turning people away. I'm going to help them. 
Uh, so yeah, that, that's that's part of what we do. And I've had no problem letting politicians or whoever it is that get in my way know that I'm going to continue serving the people. Uh, I was actually given the name the punk rock farmer by four little black kids at Flanner House. No way. Yeah, yeah. A reporter actually heard them calling me that. Uh, because I was, I, 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 I have long hair. It's in a braid right now, but I have long hair. And I was in jeans and boots and big trucks, and my tractors were there. And I was wearing a Misfit shirt or some punk rock shirt, and they started calling me the punk rock farmer. And from there, that's what it took off. And so many people said, well, your attitude's kind of that as well. So you know, <laughs> keep going. Yeah, a lot of people, they, they assume because I'm a punk rock farmer that I don't use tractors or, you know, I, I get kind of, you know, into the, 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 the more holistic stuff. Now, I want to feed as many people as possible. I love modern tech and modern ag. So that's what we use to do so. So in terms of like how things have been going in rural communities, um, we've seen the CDC reports. Um, and honestly, it sounds like, you know, it's a lot of similar issues that we see in our communities in terms of um, <clears throat> sort of systemic health disparities in terms of like having comorbidities related to smoking and blood pressure and obesity. And we're also saying that those communities are obviously just as stubborn about following the CDC guidelines and just as hesitant about the vaccine as, as our own, but for different reasons, you know, um, than communities of color. And I just wondered if you could give us like a little picture of what your experience has been like. Well, I mean, so depending on where you're going, uh, rural people are made up, you know, you have these small towns, which, by the way, a lot of those are actually food deserts as well. A mm -hmm. um, Dollar General is not a place you can get, you know, great food. Uh, Jonathan, I'm sorry to interrupt you real quick, but can you explain what a food desert is for people who may not understand? Sure. A food desert uh, by USDA standards, and an urban food desert is where someone, where majority of the population does not have transportation uh, and there's not a grocery store within a mile. Um, so walking distance should be a mile to the grocery store. Um, the rural food deserts are actually seven miles. Wow. Um, oh, wow. So, uh, so imagine a small, t there's a small town in my county called Shirley, Indiana. Uh, there is a gas station and a dollar general. If you have no transportation, those are your two options. Um, you know, Anderson is going to be your next closest place that would have a grocery store. And I think that's right at 13 miles north. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know many people who walk through. I don't know many people who walk a mile to get groceries. That's, if you're getting groceries, I, that's too far. <laughs> um, you know, uh, and that's something I've had those discussions in the urban environment as well as the rural environment. The urban environment, the frustration is buses. Um, while they catch a bus to the grocery store, oftentimes they, they miss that 15 minute increment. And the, I, I made the mistake of saying, well, the bus comes every 15 minutes. And I had an older lady laugh at me saying, you know, on a good day, it comes every 20 to 25 minutes. <laughs> if I have frozen foods and I need to get them home. I mean, she said she's had stuff thaw before she gets it home. Uh, and then in the rule, on the rural side, there's just, I would say the gas station that is like in Shirley probably gets as much food traffic by the folks who don't have transportation as the Dollar General, because the Dollar General is expensive. Um, and the gas station is located in the center of town and the Dollar General is on the outskirts. So, um, yeah, the, the. And I, I'm not dogging Dollar General. I mean, it's what's there, but at the same time, you know, it'd be awesome if they, I've seen their fresh food before. I wouldn't feed it to my hogs. I mean, that's just how I feel. And uh, I think people should should have better access than that. Yeah. <laughs> 
we agree. Um, and so what are, what are, what are some of the things, you know, how are people sort of viewing the pandemic in general? Uh, you mean in the rural areas? Uh, <laughs> they, they, like it's not happening, you know. Uh, yeah. You know, and I mean, I am one of those kind of people that I try not to tell people what to do or I try to, but at the same time, you know, when I see a 75 year old man and he's not walking around with a mask and I know he has probably has all kinds of things wrong with him, mm -hmm. uh, then maybe he should be taking precautions and the people around him should too. But I mean, a good example was I was at, here, here was the one that really stuck. I was, I was at a location recently, a livestock auction, and there was a gentleman talking behind me who had to be in his late seventies. And he said that his doctor said that he had tested positive for COVID. And he talked about being as sick as a dog for two weeks, but he knows that it wasn't COVID. He knows that it was bronchitis and they're just telling him that it was COVID. <laughs> and I was just like, I don't know if that's a cause that, you know, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know how to, you know, a doctor said, a doctor told him, you know, if your plumber tells you that, you know, you have a pipe leaking, you don't assume that, oh, that's probably from the rain or something, that the plumber's wrong. I mean, you know, so, so it's just hard. It's hard for me to understand why he, uh, I, I do think a lot of the people, I think it was, polit I think the pandemic was politicized um, by both sides and mm -hmm. both sides uh, created this, this, and I, I was one of those people that I was like, I want to listen to people like you, <laughs> like you guys, that's who we should be listening to. And, you know, uh, but it's gotten to the point to where not even doctors are trusted. Uh, by folks out in the rural communities, you know, and I, I'm trying not to generalize everybody because there are folks who took precautions. We had a farmer that was very well respected in this county who actually passed away from COVID. Mm -hmm. So there were people taking it serious. Um, and then there were other folks not taking it serious, you know, mm -hmm. that mask mandate was somehow a, a attack on their personal freedoms. I don't know. I, I, I try not to, go into that, but something that I've told like my boys personally is a private business has every right to just tell you that you have to wear a mask. I don't care what the governor said, that's their business. And, you know, I just recently seen that here with a store where a gentleman said, the governor said, we don't have to wear a mask anymore. Yeah. And the young lady was trying to explain to him, but it's our, it's our policy. It's our policy, you know, and she, he just refused to, to, he continued to argue with, and she finally, she did, she just kind of gave up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm sure it's the policy not to walk into that store and make a ruckus or do anything else. And people have no problems following those. I don't, I'm not sure why, why they feel the need to, to tell a private business owner that they're not going to follow their policy. Yeah. No shirt, no service. I've seen that sign plenty of times. Yeah. 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 And, and I'll be honest, I don't want to go and eat in a place that allows no shirt, no shirt, you know, no shirt, no shoes, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, so that's just, yeah, it, it's just, a, it's a very odd dynamic that, that I feel like uh, it was overly politicized. Wearing a mask made you a, I don't know, a good Republican and, or not wearing a mask made you a good Republican or something like that. And I was just like, gosh, you know. Science is science, you know, either, yeah. either you're going to believe that, that COVID, and I, I mean, COVID is real. As a farmer, I mean, I know what a coronavirus is because we treat cattle for it, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so it's not like it's a made up thing. Uh, and we also know about biosecurity and, you know, uh, zootonic disease. <laughs> yeah. That's what this is. So farmers... Most farmers should get that, you know, if they don't, because they, they practice biosecurity with their animals. They practice biosecurity with their crops. Same thing, biosecurity. So, 
you kind of touched on this. You know, we could, most folks know that rural America is largely red states, uh, largely Republican country and whatnot. We could talk about the political underpinnings of this issue all day. Outside of the political issues, you know, what are some of the other reasons why, you know, folks were hesitant to, you know, follow along with these guidelines and mandates? You know, how easily were people swayed by the disinformation that was sent, you know, across the country? Um, and what is the relationship folks in the rural communities have with medicine and with science that allowed them to, you know, believe these lies about COVID and, you know, the pandemic? Well, I, I will say this, the American Farm Bureau did a really, really good job of, so we, the American Farm Bureau had a hashtag called still farming mm -hmm. because farmers are essential. So there was recognition that here is a problem. The pandemic's happening. Um, farmers are still doing their thing, but what the, what Farm Bureau has done now is they've really pushed, uh, telehealth, if, I'm sure you guys are familiar with what telehealth is. And um, I think that that might be something that could really help rural communities. Uh, part of the issues with telehealth is having a decent broadband connection. Um, and it is actually the American Farm Bureau that has led the way on rural fiber optics being put in everywhere. Uh, so that rural folks have that kind of access. And by having that kind of access, they're going to have access to, and I'm not saying the internet has all correct information, yeah. but it's got information and hopefully, you know, th there, there's ways for people to, uh, to glean that information to get more help. Um, yeah. So okay. that, that's where it has been done right in the rural community. Um, you know, and again, I, I meet people that I, I have a friend who is probably the most right-wing red state guy you'd ever meet. He's absolutely horrified at the pandemic. Mm -hmm. He wore two masks. He was so happy when he got his vaccines. Um, so there, there's that, that dynamic of it. Uh, but there, I, I think a big, a big issue is just that it was politicized and it was, it was made into a, a line. And this is the line where we stand as part of a, as part of this. So therefore you can't, it's sort of like, you guys would probably not know this, but a guy who drives a John Deere, a green tractor, mm -hmm. me and him are probably gonna get along when it comes to like, who has the best equipment. A lot of times that's, you know, my equipment's orange or red. <laughs> You know, th those are the, those are, those, that's how I, that's how you kind of identify as a farmer, believe it or not. Um, and those, those type of, of, of I, I want to call it's very partisan. It's very, you know, well, if you believe in the pandemic, then you believe what the Democrats are saying. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what? I don't believe what any politician is saying. Mm -hmm. I do believe what, I believe what scientists are saying. Yeah. I have not heard a reputable scientist say that the pandemic is a joke. Yep. I have not heard a reputable, now I've heard a couple of doctors that I think were cashing in. Uh, they were talking, what, yeah, what was for it? sure. The hydrochloric clone yeah. thing. Yeah. Definitely know. would tell people to drink bleach for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah. And it's not yeah. like, you know, <laughs> you know, let's be very clear. It's, it's p farming isn't, you know, going out to an, a, a, a blank field and throwing some seeds down, right? Absolutely science, not. It science is a science, is a yeah. large yeah. part of farming. So farmers aren't anti-science either. No, no. Right. And that's, that's the funny thing. I haven't, I mean, I was talking to Nisi about this. I have not heard, so a lot of the guys who use, you know, biotechnology crops, none of them are scared of the vaccine, mm -hmm. you know? But they also understand the science. That you know, agronomy is a science. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're if you're doing a lot of stuff with animals uh, at a large scale, that's animal science. That's animal science. Yep. Even if that person might not be a veterinarian, I can promise you, you talk to a large animal 
farmer, a farmer who farms cattle, and you have one cow and there's something wrong with it, that farmer probably knows what's wrong with it because that's his life. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the joke is that farmers have to be meteorologists, veterinarians, agronomists, soil scientists, yeah. I mean, mechanics, welders. I mean, so that is that is part of farming. So I so but we're we're actually talking about two different sectors of the rural community. We're talking about farmers yeah. who are feeding people to scale, and then we're talking about say people that just live out in the country. Yeah. Or people who live in these small towns. Um yeah. you know, just I you know. I, I've spent enough time with uh, some really great guys who have shown me around places in Indianapolis, and they've given me their little, you know, spiels on what this type of person is and what this type of person is. Well, guess what? We have that in the rural community, too. I mean, that's just the way it is. And, yeah, it, I mean, we had, we had like eight deputies get COVID, and every, I mean, they were getting it, and... You know, the one deputy that I spoke to said, I didn't know I had it until I was tested. And then I found out I had it. I never had any symptoms. Another deputy, the exact same age, 30 years old, said it was the worst two weeks of his life. Mm -hmm. So that was the problem. It was such a, it was such a, and that's the thing. People want to look, oh, well, this deputy, nothing happened to him. That's what COVID is. It's just a bad cold. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It just thought, depends on your, your bodily makeup, I think. So. Yeah. I thought maybe I would um, share a little bit of that science um, really quickly before we move on um, and just kind of uh, go over some of the basics that we like to do. Um, as you said, you know, SARS-CoV-2 is a coronavirus. COVID-19 is a disease that it causes. So it's like a lot of other um, viruses in that it's just like a little protein bubble and it's got like, you know, a little viral inside, viral RNA inside in this case, which is kind of like DNA, but it's just one single strand instead of a double helix. And then outside are all the spike proteins that we've heard about. And in this case, these are like the actual ID card that your immune system checks when it meets a foreign invader, right? The spike protein for this virus, that's the pickpocket who opens the doors to your cells. Um, and so essentially you have this receptor ACE2 that we've heard about, and that's um, where the spike protein locks into like a key into a lock. <clears throat> and these locks are found all over your body, which is why there's been so many people that have had different systems, different like long-term permanent damage to various organs because those those doors are everywhere. Um, so once the virus kind of latches onto that receptor, um, it catches a free ride inside your cell. The receptor just flips over and brings it inside. And then once it gets there, it like steals your copy machine to make its own copies, right? Because um, essentially the little piece of RNA here is, is a lot like your DNA in terms of the code that could be read from it, right? And so instead of making the things that your body needs, the things that your cells need to do the jobs that it needs to do, it starts making virus particles, right? And so your cells stop working for you and start working for the virus instead. Um, so when everybody wants to talk about like how the vaccine is changing their DNA, it doesn't, yeah. um, but the virus, will supplant your DNA, it will, it will make, it will make, turn your stuff off so that you can make it, its particles. And the next thing you know, you are a host factory. And then all of the new viral particles that you made <clears throat> um, exit the cell and then come out through your breath and your spit and your sneezes and all of the talking that you do um, and walking around town with no mask on. And viruses need hosts to survive. That's that's the key factor here. And we stubbornly keep giving it hosts. The virus is ecstatic that we don't listen to scientists. <laughs> um, so in terms of like, you know, one of the things that you were talking about 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 access, you know, one of the bit one of the major things that the CDC has noted about um, some of the issues in, in rural communities is the fact that they're 
is not always good access in terms of hospital capacity and, and getting emergent, you know, immediate care. Um, and with all, with having all the same predispositions that obviously, you know, um, make those communities more, more vulnerable, I guess, you know, it's, to me, I would think it would be even more important because there's already a crisis in many places in terms of ICU capacity, but even more so in, in rural areas, right? Yeah, I mean, our hospital, uh, our hospital actually did an amazing job of communicating. Um, so I, I know of a couple of hospitals that are in rural settings that, yeah, they, they got, they, they were sending patients elsewhere just because they were, they were overburdened quickly. I mean, and, you know, our hospital, our local hospital is Hancock Regional. Um, it is a county hospital. Uh, I think it's one of the largest county hospitals in the state of Indiana. Um, so it's not a great example of a rural hospital just because it's bigger than most. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is pretty big. Yeah. <laughs> that was, I mean, in general, that's, that's like the issue, right? For most. But I can tell you like Shelby County, place where I farm, where I'm active in, uh, Major General was overwhelmed. Um, and it's not because they're not a great hospital. I mean, yeah, and they no. get the message out. Hey, you know, so you, you did, you had doctors, you know, I personally don't know that doctors love us rural people all that much because we don't listen to them anyway. <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> well, just to give you an example is I was hurt in a tractor uh, pretty good. And the beautiful thing about it is our, the emergency responders know exactly what to do. Mm -hmm. I don't know that a city fire department would know what to do in that situation. Um, but at the same time, that's the kind of stuff. I mean, they, they know how to do silo rescues. Uh, the, 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 our emergency room is used to dealing with, you know, people that get hurt cutting wood or this or that, some, some heart things. Um, but they weren't, I, even as great as they were, they weren't ready for a pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, I think our CEO came from a larger hospital and was read, and he's been growing the hospital anyway. Uh, he understood it. Our, the, the director of medicine there, um, who actually is a personal friend of mine, um, he was ready, you know, because he had come from, he actually came from India and he talks about healthcare in the United States all the time, um, being so much better than it was in India. Um, but that being said, he still, he was like, he was very frustrated. One of his frustrations was talking to young people is they were saying, well, I'm not at risk. And he's finally stopped saying, well, yeah, you could be. He started saying, you're not, but your grandparents are. You can make your grandparents sick. Uh, he currently is a flight surgeon in the military and told me that COVID went through the military barracks like fire. Hmm. And the problem with that is you had all these young fit people that a lot of them, he said, were asymptomatic, but then you had the older people that were interacting with them. Um, they weren't ready for that. And he said, that's, that's where they seen their casualties were yeah. the older, uh, and these are people that were actively serving in the military, but, you know, their immune systems weren't prepared for, you know, uh, what had happened. He, he talked about three different officers that were on ventilators because, and they, these were guys who, you know, just kind of scoffed at the, the, the rules and I don't know, it's it, it just a, uh, that there, there, I felt like there was a lot of young people that were kind of selfish, um, saying that, that this doesn't affect me. So, uh, and I don't know that that message got out there. It might not affect you, <laughs> but it sure as heck can affect your, you know, 75 year old grandmother who is a diabetic. I mean, it's almost guaranteed to affect her. So why wouldn't you do everything to protect her? Um, yeah, it, it was just, I mean, the schools here took it fairly serious. Um, just a lot of the people uh, just didn't, 
didn't uh, take it as serious as I think it should have been taken. There were, my son went into Kroger at the outset of the pandemic wearing a mask before there was a mask mandate. And he had three different people tell, say to him, that's a little much, isn't it? Um, oh, I mean, nobody wears a mask in Greenfield, let's be clear. I mean, no. anywhere, no. ever. So. Um, if I walk into a place without a mask, it's literally because I came off the farm and it's I, I got so used to carrying a mask in my pocket. Uh, and I, I remember I walked into, I walked into a store and nobody had a mask on and neither did I. And I was going, it didn't matter that they didn't because I felt, I felt weird. Dude, I've had nightmares about that. <laughs> and you're like, oh, no. You know, and, and that's the thing. I mean, when the governor lifted the mask mandate, um, there, there were stores, and there's still stores here, though, that say, we want you to wear a mask. Um, we just went out to eat last night, and the restaurant is like, we know the mask mandate's being lifted. Will you, will you please wear a mask? And, you know, and that was actually in Pendleton, and there were people adhering to it, so I thought that was pretty good. Um, but, yeah, it's just a, it's a, it, it's, it, it's just a weird it, it's almost like, remember when all the people gathered to protest at the governor's mansion about masks? Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, I was just like, I've, ne I've never protested. So, but if I was going to protest, it <laughs> sure wouldn't be about having you know, <laughs> to wear a mask to, to protect public safety, you know? Yeah, um, yeah I totally understand. Yeah, but I mean, even even in the middle of the pandemic, I know a lot of people they walk around, they walk around, they didn't care, they they not wear masks, you know. Um, I I kind of even though like on the farm, I'm like I get really dirty, and uh, it's pretty it's pretty you know I'll eat after I've been touching animals or whatever, but this is my life. This is all I know, and. So I'm pretty used to that, but if I go out into the public, I still I still carry a bottle of hand sanitizer just because you know I don't oh, yeah. know on cart before me and stuff like that if they if they have it, and so like I know I, I had the antibodies for COVID. Um, I don't ever remember being sick. Hmm. Okay. But I just think about that. That's that's worse than having the symptoms. Yeah. Because then you're spreading it yeah. and. I'm glad that I took, I did wear a mask. And, and the funny thing is, as soon as we had that come back, me and my wife both just for, we quarantined ourselves for two weeks. Um, even though it was antibodies, but negative for COVID, which, yeah. you know, I, I still was just like, I, I don't know. That was still early on when the testing was kind of this and that. I was actually supposed to give blood that my, my friend who Dr. Jinder Kumar actually wanted me to give blood, I guess for antibodies. Again, I don't know the medical side of it, but he said there was a way I could give my antibodies to people. So um, yeah, that was the, the, the lack of, uh, you know, just the lack of, of caring about yeah. it was the, was the hard part. Quick, quick question. How have farming procedures and the way workers are operating inside farm, how has that changed since COVID? So that really hasn't changed, but it's not, it's because we kind of didn't need to. Um, we're not, you know, in, in an open field operation, you're not on top of each other. Yep. You're, you're separated. Uh, you know, other than sorting produce, um, and we've always, we're a GAP certified farm, so we take hygiene to that level anyway. Um, you know, we're, we're, so when, once the tomatoes are picked or whatever produce is picked, uh, it, and we're, we're a field packed farm, meaning it's packed in the field, but when it, once it goes into the, it goes into a cooler um, and nothing, you know, it's actually marked and tracked uh, so there, there's not a whole lot of, uh, 
interaction there. I do know a lot of people were concerned about this jumping from people to cattle. Mm -hmm. um, so there were guys that were a little bit worried about that at first. Uh, I, you know, biosecurity should be in place for raising animals anyway. Um, if it's not, that's, you know, that's kind of, uh, it's just kind of, it's kind of necessary. Um, I don't know how bad COVID was, but I personally have experienced cryptospermordium, if you know what that is. No. It's actually a parasite you catch from a cow. Oh. I, I, for, it was awful. Oh, um, no. <laughs> it was bad, bad, bad. Um, the sickest I've ever been, and I haven't had it since, um, but yeah, we change policy how we do things. Just, yeah. you know, what the first thing we do is we vaccinate our cattle so they don't carry it, <laughs> um, you know, and, and, and that might be another reason why, why farmers aren't too real, aren't super reluctant to get this. You know about we, vaccines. We vaccinate our, so we vaccinate our cattle for tetanus for black leg, for, you know, corona. So with, with uh, calves, there's a coronavirus that, that we can't even get. Mm -hmm. But the calves can get it, they're dead. I mean, if they get it and it goes full on, it, it, and it's actually, it actually attacks their intestines. It doesn't attack them in the lungs. Um, so they get something called scours, which is really bad diarrhea. And it's to the point where it doesn't matter how much liquid you give them, they can't. They can't keep up, and it just you know it, it takes them out. Uh, so yeah, that, that's something that that we. As a matter of fact, I I personally accidentally vaccinated myself with Corona one time. <laughs> with, with, the, with the one for cattle, I would you know you got to move the cow skin, and right as I went to stick, he and I stuck myself right in that thumb. I was like, okay, I, I hope I'll be okay. <laughs> I didn't have any weird effects. I didn't grow horns or anything. So, how do you are you familiar with how things may have changed in you know for animal farmers or for meatpacking industries? Yeah, I mean, so the meatpacking industries uh, they have changed things. Um, I can't say all of them have. I know a couple of the big players have. Tyson Foods has went, and, and I can say Tyson had a a. Uh, they had something where a uh, few employees were, were doing something. I've been very intimate and worked with Tyson. And I can tell you overall as a company that that was not in there. That, 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 that's not their culture. What happened there at Tyson with the people betting on who would get Corona or not. No. That is definitely not Tyson's culture. Um, you're talking about a company that has donated 56 million pounds of protein. Um, that, that, that's, that's millions of dollars, uh, and a company that is striving to, to be, to have a less carbon footprint in everything they do. Um, that being said, while there was a lot of things in place to protect you as a consumer, you know, from any type of foodborne illness, packing plants are... You know, they're, they're congested, they're tight places. Uh, and a lot of uh, a lot of people from, you know, the Hispanic community work in the, that industry. Um, and there's a lot of communal living within uh, the Hispanic community anyway. Um, so I think that was, th that on top of that, it just ended up being a perfect storm for them. Mm -hmm. um, but, they, they have they, they have fixed things to, to make it better for their employees. Tyson is actually putting in medical centers now uh, where their major processing plants are. And I don't know any other uh, other large processor that's going that far for their employees. So, really cool. you know, so, and it's, yeah. they're putting science first too, which yeah, really appreciate it also. So we all lived through uh, the year that was 2020 and we know what a disastrous response 
there was to the pandemic. Um, let them drink bleach, I suppose, was was pretty much the plan for the first 15 months. But um, one of the other devastating consequences was just the worsening of the hunger crisis during the pandemic. Like, can we talk about what it was like when 40 million Americans lost their job and then even more people, you know, had no access to food? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, so let me first be, say this, and I am actually a fan of, and I'll say this and then add to it, I'm a fan of our food system in the United States. Mm -hmm. That being said, our food system has tons and tons and tons of room <laughs> to improve. Um, I often hear we need to throw, away, throw out our food system, throw it out and start from scratch. And that means buying from local farmers and only doing it that way. That is a huge lack of understanding logistics. Because mm. the logistics that go into feeding America, I, I, think, I think I heard when you see a truck on the road, uh, 34, 35% of the trucks that you see on the road are carrying food. Mm. Um, and from, from, from a standpoint of our food system, that as an American farmer, I'm the, I'm the first step in that, all the way to the end consumer. Um, people that did not lose their jobs. I'm not talking about people that had catastrophic thing happen to them. I'm talking about the average American that went to a grocery store and of course there was no toilet paper. Yeah, yep. But yeah, something, something that I thought was interesting is, and I checked, if you went to a Kroger in Greenfield or you went to the Kroger that was on 10th Street in Indianapolis, there was chicken, but it wasn't great chicken. It was, you know, the, the chicken thighs or, you know, you, you didn't have the breast or the, the drumsticks or whatever. Um, the meat cuts, they, they weren't, the, the prime meat cuts, they weren't there. Um, I noted in Kroger, it was kind of weird. There was no Captain Crunch. I mean, it was gone. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be honest with you, I mean, you know, like, this is weird. I also I also am weird about I drink a, a lactose free milk called Fair Life. Mm. That was gone. It was gone. There oh was yeah, there were no lactose free milk. Like I could attest to that. <laughs> there was plenty of just Kroger milk. But there wasn't, and, and I noticed it was the same thing on 10th Street. And yeah. It, it was just, it was just odd to me. But if I went to the produce section of either one of those, they had all the produce you could want. Mm -hmm. People weren't buying, they weren't like gobbling up produce. And that tells me that America has forgotten how to eat. <laughs> you know, there should be vegetables next to the meat that you're eating. I mean, there really should be. Um, that, that being said, uh, I, I heard horror stories in other countries where, you know, the, the pandemic was also ravaging. Um, but there was also a logistics issue. You know, we had truck drivers that were still driving the food to the warehouses for distribution, but the warehouses were, were closed because everybody had COVID. You know, the truck driver can't deliver that straight to the store. But at the same time, when I hear, well, if we just went to everybody buying from local farms, you know, can I ask you to, when was the last time you guys drove out to a local farm and bought milk? I don't, I'm like just intolerant, so never. never. <laughs> I, have a, yeah, I literally have a farm five minutes from my house. <laughs> and I'm Are they dairy? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know where you, what, what do you know of a farm? That you can just go and drive to and get. I know one that no, I don't. within it's about thirty five minutes north of Indianapolis. Yeah, we used to do like a co op where we would go to like a, a central place and pick up like boxes every couple weeks, but we never drove out to the place. Right. So yeah. when I hear that, you know, or you know, they could they should buy their beef from a local farmer. Well, that local farmer 
needs to be able to take it to a processor so it can be processed. And one guy actually said to me, well, I think you should be allowed to process beef on your farm. I see nothing wrong with that. Sure, you should be allowed to do that. But should a consumer have to take the risk of the contamination that might happen from doing that on a local farm? You know, that, that, that's, that's part of the issue. I mean, this, this, the, the amount of garbage that I hear as a farmer that people tell me, um, I had one girl say that her children, she told me how sick her children was and she wanted to know where she could get raw milk. And I was like, you mean like unpasteurized milk? And she said, yeah. I said, I thought you said your kids were sick. <laughs> she said, well, I read that raw milk will treat all these different illnesses. I was like, there was a small study done at the Mayo Clinic that it might treat asthma to a certain extent, but the risk far outweighs the reward there because if everything's not perfect, you don't know what you're getting in that milk, you know? Now, a dairy farmer who takes a drink of raw milk in the environment that he's lived in or she's lived in that entire time around cattle that they've been around, what people don't understand is their immune system, there was actually a study done about farmers' immune systems, how our immune systems are way uh, back. Yeah, <laughs> exposed everything. And that's the funny thing is, I wouldn't want somebody that, say, is living in a suburb to just drive out to a farm and buy raw, and they do it. They sell it as pet milk right now at farmer's markets because that's the legal way to label it. And I just think about, there's there's so many things that can happen. <laughs> no, 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 don't do that. <laughs> that you know, it just is horrifying to me. And, you know, so saying that we, our, our food system can be improved. It, 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 it doesn't need to be thrown away. Our food system can be more equitable. Um, more grocery stores, you know, in urban areas that can compete with a large box store. I had a grocery store. I actually, we actually had to close our grocery store because um, three of our employees had, and that's the other thing that people don't talk about with COVID, the violence. You know, our area got really bad. Um, after my third employee was assaulted, I said, I'm not... I'm not going to do this anymore. Um, I can't be here. And I'm not going to tell somebody else to work in an environment where they tell me we really need a security guard. Mm. Well, we're there to help the community. I can take those people and I can employ them elsewhere where they're not in jeopardy. Um, and I can still feed the community because we have a logistics team and we can get food where it needs to go. We don't have to have a brick and mortar. And we, we, I've actually known that our grocery store actually fed less people than our mobile markets did. I mean, it, it, was, it was a tremendous difference because our mobile markets could hit so many different areas versus that grocery store only concentrated on that one area. Um, you, you, you mentioned equity, and, and I'm interested in kind of traveling down that path um, you know, to talk about nutritional equity but also, you know, the type of equity that exists in rural communities for black farmers um, to produce, um, you know, uh, food and uh, food supplies for the, for the American public. What do you know about what the USDA is doing to help with um, equitable farming? So what I'm hoping the USDA is going to do is going to make sure that it's equally distributed. So first off, let me give you a, a picture of what U.S. farmers are. We are one and a half percent of, and th this is including white farmers, Hispanic farmers, and black farmers. We are one and a half percent of the population. So, and we're feeding everybody else. Um, there are, I believe it's 138,000 recognized scaled black farms. My hope is that that money is distributed amongst those 138,000 or 139,000 and not distributed to a conglomerate that is black owned, but also owned by 
you know, sub subsidiary A and subsidiary B. You know, that's my hope um, because the the if we can get those those farmers back, get give back what was taken from them, you know, that would be a huge step forward. I think it would encourage other people to start to become that first generation black farmer. Yeah, and what you're talking about is, um, you know, and I think in 1920, there were over a million black farms in the United States. And I think in 2010, it was some it's sub sub 100,000 at, at this point. Um, and a lot of that had to do with the inequity um, with getting farm loans, uh, being able to get equipment for your farms um, that black farmers faced. And so a lot of those farms had to shut down. So what you're, you're talking about now is, you know, what the USDA is hoping to do to, you know, help those black farmers, you know, reach the point of equity that they were missing years ago. Yeah. And, and believe it or not, it's a it's it's also breaks down into regions. Um, actually, the most successful black farmers even today are still in the South. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's weird to be in Indiana. Like I know all like three scale black farmers. Indiana, you know, we're a farm state. There should be a lot more than that, um, but there's not. But you go to South Georgia, Tipton, Georgia. <laughs> You throw a rock, you're going to get a black farmer. And, and it's, it's, and they're successful. And, you know, for whatever reason, that success, well, I know the reason. <laughs> yeah, you we know the reason. <laughs> success is not trans. But I think it's also about migration, probably, because a lot of probably people who migrated to the north were looking for like steel factory jobs at that time. And also, you know, a lot of the places that you're alluding to in the Midwest and the North um, are on the Green Book. So we're not trying to go shut up shop there. <laughs> so, there's that too. There's a lot of terrorism. I mean, we just lynched somebody in Bloomington, Indiana last summer. So, you know. Well, and so on top of that, so part, part of the problem too is there, there's this, and I don't know. So a friend of mine, he he is a he is a awesome guy. Um, he mostly does hay, and he's older. So being an older generation, but being a, I think he's a fourth generation black farmer. Um, he asked me. He goes, "What is with these people in the urban areas saying? Well, we're going to teach you know black kids how to grow food. Here's how you do a garden." And this is a life skill. And he, he's like, I personally think we should be teaching them, you know, if that's what they're interested in, let's teach them how to grow 100,000 tomato plants because that's a completely different process. That's where science and that's where, yeah. you know, genetics, a lot of all that. Yeah. And uh, he's very frustrated with a lot of the urban farm movement stuff, mm -hmm. as am I, you know. Um, I mean, I, I hate to say this. I, I, I make no bones about, you know, I'm a punk rock farmer not caring for hipsters. And <laughs> there's nothing worse to see, like, a, a neighborhood that is in the middle of gentrification. And <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's the one yeah. lot. And there, there's, these, the, there's these very crunchy white folks in there, and they've got tools that they used on... Little House on the Prairie, you know, it's like their tools came off that set and they're like, this is, this is the way you produce food for a neighborhood. And I'm like, no, it's not. That's not how you do it. You, 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 you plant, number one, they plant 500 different things. There's not enough of anything to make a difference. Yeah. Um, they're scared to death of chemicals. I mean, scared to death of them. A chemical is not allowed. Half their crop gets eaten. And what they don't understand is that a, a responsible farmer doesn't allow that to happen to their crop. Mm -hmm. And if they want to be organic, there are organic methods. There are organic chemicals. People, people are shocked when I say that. They're like, what do you mean there's organic chemicals? I'm like, well, <laughs> water is organic. You know, I mean, it's, it's their chemicals. And yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I see that. Um, 
you know, I, I know so many black farmers that people in Indiana don't see them as part of yeah. agriculture. Yeah. And agriculture history is black history. I mean, that, that goes back to, you know, everybody, everybody, every time, I haven't got any animosity for George Washington Carver. I, I don't have animosity for him, but I'm <laughs> sick and tired of just hearing about him as if he's the only person that has done anything for agriculture from the black community. That's just not true. I mean, that's, Utterly not true. I mean, I, I know of tomato plant varieties that are were started by black growers. They, they were started by black plant breeders. Um, yeah, it's it, it, that, that's a frustrating point. I mean, uh, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about like some of the work that you guys do helping black farmers set up like with Hen the Henry Blair Farm? So the Henry Blair Farm is at Edna Martin Christian Center. And they wanted to call it the Edna Martin Christian Center Farm, which is great because it's on their property. But I begged them to call it the Henry Blair Farm. And just so you know, I am sitting across the table from three African-American professionals, very educated, very much care for their community, had never heard of Henry Blair. And I'm just like, oh, Henry Blair invented the first mechanical corn plant in 1829. <laughs> and he, he had like 20 acres. And how they planted corn, and this is no kidding, he would hire people. He would hire three people. So you had two guys going down the, the, the rows, and they had sticks that were sharpened, and they poked them into the ground. And then the guy, the third guy, is taking one corn at a time and putting them in the holes. Can you imagine how long it would take on 20 acres? Wow. So Henry Blair built this, this it, it's a cedar. And what it did was it actually had spindles in it that would capture one seed and it would make a furrow and drop the seed in there. And he figured the horse would cover it up as he went. So it went from, you know, two weeks with three guys to plant 20 acres of corn to Henry Blair, his horse, in a day. And he could plant it all. Wow. You know, so that, 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 he's literally like the Bill Gates or Steve Jobs of agriculture and nobody seems to care. Wow. Yeah. Which just, so then he goes on, he invents a general seed planter, he invented a new cotton planter. But with the cotton and the seed planter, the general seed planter, both of them, it actually covered up the seed. The, the machine itself dug the furrow, planted the seed, and then covered it up. That was like in 1831. Mm. And he shared his, he was like, hey, you know, anybody wants to know how to do this, he got a patent for it. I was at, in a, uh, I was at a museum in uh, Atlanta and I felt weird because I am a white guy and the lady was sitting there talking about Henry Blair was the second black man ever to get a patent and I was like and and she's like well he's the second black man to get a patent I'm like what did he freaking patent though he patented the mechanical corn plant she's like yeah something to do with farming I'm like the very thing that revolutionized modern, the, the very thing that put American farmers to the forefront, you know, he, he came up with that. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, nobody, <laughs> nobody cares. And it's just, it's, so I just ask, can you please name the farm the Henry Blair Farm? You know, just so that he has some type of recognition. I mean, he personally, he should tractors, in it, you know, there's Massey and Ferguson, the Massey Ferguson tractor, that's two Scottish guys. You know, John Deere, we all know who he is because he's got green tractors everywhere. Um, I mean, all, all these tractors, Oliver's and, you know, all us Chalmers, but there's no such thing as a Henry Blair tractor. So at some point, I might actually, if I can get the time, I would make, you know, my own model of tractor 
Maybe the first electric tractors could be called the Henry Blair tractor. <laughs> that would be so cool. Be awesome. <laughs> yeah. awesome. So you know, I'll, I'll, drop, I'll drop a tweet to uh, Elon Musk and say, hey, if you start working on this, you need to call the, you know, you name your car as Tesla, name your tractor as Blair, you know, so. So we know that a lot of um, enslaved folks that came to the, the new world um, were skilled and understood agriculture very well. And um, so a lot of them were shopped around to different areas based on the, their expertise in growing certain crops. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, watermelon is actually an African fruit. Um, a lot of people don't know that it actually originated in Northern Africa. Uh, cucumbers as well. Um, that was something that, that a lot of people don't understand. But there's like this mindset that they we were, were just we were just mindless workers, you know. Just... Well, funny enough, and I I won't say the name of the university, but a leading ag educator that really pushes that hipster, crunchy, this is the way we do this, actually shared a thing on Facebook, and my wife would not let me respond to her because I wanted to respond so bad. And she she called about a huck patch. Do you, are you guys familiar with what a huck patch is? No. Yeah. So a huck patch is where the slaves actually grew their own food. Okay. And she had actually taken a picture. She was doing a plantation tour and she had taken a picture <laughs> of a sign that talked about the huck patch. <clears throat> she, like, she goes, can you believe this? Even after all the, everything that the slaves had to do, they still somehow figured out how to even grow their own food. And I was like, who do you think was growing the food for the people living in the big house? They were like, in the garden, you know? They, they were growing all the food. <laughs> there's a pattern of suppressing our contributions to agricultural yeah. science because it's easier to paint us as just like... Mindless we zombies. Yeah, we're just used for a sweat equity and for torture play. But, but, that's it. The horse... The horse, Dan Patch, the, the national winning horse, he was actually started by slave line. I mean, it was slaves who bred the, the, the horse that eventually produced Dan Patch, which is considered genetically one of the, he's up there with secretary. So yeah, and, and actually they had to pass a law because there were slave owners that said, sure, as slaves, you could sell like sell your rights, to, if they bred their own livestock, they could sell it, stuff like that. Well, they had to pass a law in some states because the slaves would be able to buy their own freedom because they weren't like producing like junk. They were producing top-end cattle, top-end hogs, top-end horses. Horses back then were, were means of transportation and they knew enough about the genetics and what to look for because they were the ones working with those animals every day, you know? Um, yeah, th th again, it was the mindset that, that they were just told, you go out into a field and show them what to do. They weren't shown what to do. They already knew what to do. Mm -hmm. um, and that translated to some really successful farms once, once they were actually able to get their own land, which was, which, you know, even then, uh, and, and this is this is where I feel like the government really worked hard to pit people against each other, because both, you know, black people and and the lower income whites were sharecroppers, but their whole goal was to make sure that that white guy that was, you know, driving the same mule as the black guy across the road somehow felt that he was better than him. You know, uh, Brandon Cosby from Flanner House always shared with me, I, I, I don't remember which, I, I don't wanna say which president it was, but it was a president that said, as long as we, we can make sure that the, the poor white people in the South think that they're better than anybody that's black, we'll have their vote. And, you know, that, that's been used to, you know, like, like here's the funny thing. You know the term redneck, 
actually the, the actual term calling a redneck. Do you know what a redneck actually is? Like where that term comes from? No. It comes from a poor classless or no account, meaning they couldn't even get an account at the at the company store or at the country general store that didn't own slaves. So they were doing farm work themselves. Oh. And their necks, you know, were red. And that's what, and they, they were, you know, that, I mean, there's some people that today, you know, redneck, they, but the, the actual term redneck for a long time was a white person of no, you know, they, they didn't own their land. They were mortgaging it or they were, were renting it from somebody else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they didn't own slaves. I'm not sure how it, how it, turned into its terminology today, but that's the etymology of the word. And it just, it's continued to uh, yeah. used as a, I mean, it, it's funny, my, 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 uh, both of my boys were actually, uh, they, they, they showed up to help on an urban farm and the lady didn't know, the lady that was from from another community garden thing, didn't know that the person she was talking to was a board member <laughs> of Brandywine Creek Farms. She goes, I can't believe this, you know, this isn't good. They bring these redneck kids in here to help do this farm stuff. And wow. yeah, and it was, you know, I, I told them wear it like a badge of honor because the difference between you and them is you're doing something and they're just talking. So, you know, it, it doesn't matter. And, uh, you know, you had an interesting parallel when we spoke previously about, about this idea about, you know, sort of the feudal poor, as it were, in, in slavery and, um, and how they were sort of used in the Civil War and how that kind of parallels with today. Yeah. And I mean, Nobody that was bleeding for the South, you know, were slave owners. They were sold. So, so every state, every single state, I don't care. I, mean, I, I hear this garbage all the time. Well, half the states seceded over state rights. No, they didn't. Every one of them lists that slavery was one of the reasons they seceded. You know, um, usually it was at the very top. Very top, slavery. That's why we're seceding. You're going to take away our slaves, we're going to secede. Um, but that wasn't what was sold to the, the working poor in the South. What was told to them is the North's going to come in here and tell you what to do and what you're allowed to do and can't do. You need to defend your state, your state's rights. You know, you need to defend all this stuff. And, uh, when the Emancipation Proclamation happened, there were one third of the Confederate Army deserted because the Emancipation Proclamation confirmed to these people that they're actually fighting for the very people who have mortgages on their farm that keep them suppressed yeah. to keep their slaves. Yeah. You know, and that that's that's and, and, and that's what every war I feel like is a spot. They the people that actually have the most to gain from winning the war aren't the ones who shed blood or shed their own blood. They they send somebody else, they send somebody else's kids to do it. But I honestly wonder what what would be that watershed moment in this era. What what would what would make people think, you know what? I think I might turn around and see whose hand is in my back pocket for a change. You know, I think I'm gonna stop worrying about the black and browns and the others. I, I think, that's I think that guy has his hand in my back pocket. You know, like what would what would do that this in this era? That's probably the greatest thing that the government has done is to make you know poor white people believe that they don't have anything at all in common with yeah. you know, poor black and brown folks when the majority of our lives are so similar. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's, it's the biggest, most tragic irony of human civilization is that they don't, is that they don't understand how racism harms them as well, yeah. how white supremacy, and they're co-opting it blindly Heart keeps them in bondage just like those farmers yeah. <laughs> in the civil war it's it's not 
it, it's just odd when, again, like you, I mean, see, you know my political beliefs. I'm a, I'm like a very staunch libertarian. I, I don't like a, either party. Ever, period. I didn't even vote. Yeah. Well, mm. Funny to me is there's there's a flag called the Gatson flag, flag, and it's don't tread on me. And it means something to different people. It means something to me, but then I see what it means to this guy, and I'm like, that's not what it means. But the funniest thing I see is I'll see that don't tread on me flag. <laughs> and right next to it, they've got a thin blue line flag. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, it's almost like one of those things where, you know, like a meme on Facebook, one of these two things don't go together. Right. The cognitive dissonance. <laughs> yes. And it's real. Thing, you know. It's real. And, and I, I, again, I'm not going to, I, I, I can't, I just don't understand it. You know, it's, it's just a, a weird, uh, it's a weird dynamic. That I honestly, just like chalk it up to anti-blackness at the end of the day, because I don't know what else could be so compelling that you, I mean, tell them the story about the guy who completely like denied the subsidy. Like, People will just cut their whole nose, eyes, ears, and mouth off despite their face, just to know that that, that, that we're going to get the shaft. You know. What was funny was I, and I won't name him, and I won't say what county he's from, but I really thought he was a a, a good guy. Um, I, I really, I really, man, he grew the most amazing corn. That's what, I will say that, and. I decided, you know, what would be awesome is if I just let him take over my corn operation, my sweet corn operation. That's one less crop I have to worry about. He does it better than me. He grows better corn than me. I'll just, I'll provide the seed. I'll provide fertilizer. He plants it on his ground and I pay him. And uh, we were going to do about $75,000 worth of business with him that first season. <laughs> He just, he told me that he wasn't going to, he wasn't going to grow corn for a bunch of lazy N-words in Indianapolis. And I was like, yeah. what? It, it was so weird when he first said it that I thought. <laughs> he gave up a hundred stacks because well, he didn't want to mess with well, black people. Is he, just, is he just being a typical, you know, yeah. just being, being kind of, and he was serious. He was really serious, and I was just like, you need to go back to business school, you know, because the money I'm offering you isn't black, it's green, you know. Does that matter? I do with it. <laughs> and he, yeah, he didn't, he, he did not want it. I was, either that or, I mean, I, I just cannot figure for the life of me why he would give up such a awesome opportunity, other than he must. Really hate N-words. <laughs> <laughs> but um that kind of brings us to like sort of the work that we're doing together and and how we kind of keep running up against brick walls to try to get things going and how we came to partner in the first place and just kind of want you to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that you have in terms of like distribution and the kind of the kind of operation you have as a nonprofit farm like what what your mission like what are we trying to do here you know <laughs> yeah i mean so our goal is to make you know besides feeding people we want to make new farms we want people to look at agriculture mm -hmm. and think about all the different things that you can go and be in agriculture um i really like those kids that that say they don't think college is cut out for them because there's a whole nother opportunity here for them to okay, college doesn't work for you, but what about a technical college where you get a two-year degree in agriculture and then you go work for a seed company, become a field scout, learn to fly a drone. I mean, you, you, there's all kinds of things that they can do. Um, a lot of times in order to get a kid to be like, I want to be a farmer, I just put them in the seat next to me on the tractor. And because my tractor isn't off of, you know, uh, you know, green acres. I mean, I have satellite in my tractor. I mean, I have a radio, but I have all the, these controls. 
I had one kid get in it. He's like, this is like, like an airplane cockpit. I was like, I know, isn't it awesome? <laughs> you know, this, this is, you know, it can talk to a satellite, tells me where to, where to plant or where, where to go. Um, I even told him if you see big mazes, you know, where people draw something in the middle of a corn maze, what they've actually done is they, they didn't go in and cut that corn down. They actually used satellite talking to a GPS and planted corn a certain way. And it tells the tractor where to go. And as the farmer, you're just there to make sure that everything works okay. Um, the animal sciences, you know, a lot of times, <laughs> I, I, I had, this occasionally makes me teary-eyed. I, I had a group of kids come out from the Day Spring Center, which is an amazing center in Indianapolis um, that hosts uh, kids who are experiencing homelessness. And I had a bull, and his name was King Zeus. That was his name. And he, he was a belted Galloway. So to give you an idea of what a belted Galloway is, he's, I don't know if you've ever seen the cows that are black. They call them Oreo cookie cows because they have the black front, a white middle, and then a black rear end. Well, Zeus was 2,200 pounds. So he was a big bull and he had the big buffalo head. And we didn't even really plan it, but I was taking them up to show them the other cows and Zeus walked by. And when he walked, he walked, I mean, we're talking about a 2,200 pound animal. He stopped in front of all the kids. It's in the morning, it's about 68 degrees, and he snorted. And when he snorted, steam just rolled out of his ears or out of his nostrils. And then he just kept on walking. One of those kids looked at me and goes, that must be like what a dinosaur was. <laughs> and I was like, yes. And to that kid, I mean, to my kids, that's work. That, that, that Zeus represents, I've got to go feed this jerk that tries to run us into the ground all the time. But that kid had never seen a a bull, no less, five feet away, even though he's on the he's safely on the other side of the fence, that's still five feet away. And then being able to go up and touch cows. You know how many kids I've said, I never knew a cow felt like that. You know, they feel like a really soft dog or, you know, their fur is this or that, or, you know, how long, long a cow's tongue is. And then I can explain to them that they use that tongue to grab, you know, grass out of the ground and they consume it and how they have a ruminant, you know, to, to, to process things that we can't eat. And um, it was really, really, you know, that, 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 that is where I see so many kids just light up. I will say there's a huge, huge disconnect that if I don't get them when they're, you know, seven to 12, yeah. You know, at 17 or 18, there seems to not be a whole lot of. So with those kids, I do something different. <laughs> I'll actually walk. And I usually look for the kid that thinks he's the biggest and the baddest. And I walk him in with a cow, you know, and they're walking with me. I turn around and I say something like, oh, man, you're wearing red. And... <laughs> you know, no, 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 no. I mean, they, 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 and he's like am I going to get attacked am I and then, then that, that conversation turns from you know and, and it's kind of funny whether it's a rural white kid from, from a town or a kid from the inner city they both understand pit bulls for some reason mm. the dog pit bulls so when I show them a 450 pound boar hog and say, you know what? Think of the biggest, meanest, toughest pit bull you can think of. If we tossed him in there, he would simply be that hog's next meal. Yeah. So, yeah. What? And I said, <laughs> well, that hog can bite twice as hard as a Bengal tiger. And then they go, what? And I was like, hogs have eaten people. Yeah. All of a sudden, hogs are cool. <laughs> And they want to know more about hogs, and they want to and they start asking questions about the other things. You know, it, it's it's about being able to show them that you know, and the, you know, I mean, it, it's it's stuff that we don't think about or we take for granted on the farm, but it's a it's a way to get into them, and then they get interested. And I mean, I had one kid come back, and he was he was eighteen, and he goes. 
He goes, did you know that? And I don't even remember what he said, but he had been on Google researching hogs. I mean, because he started asking me all kinds of questions and he was asking about tusk or he was asking about, he asked me, oh, I remember, he said, what is the difference between a gilt and a sow? And I was like, Ooh, you just don't, that's just not something that you, you would just think about. That's something very specific to a hog operation. So he was doing some research and I explained to him what it was. And he was, he just wanted, he wanted to know. He, he started asking, well, why are some cows called cows and some are called heifers? You know, because he didn't know. Um, and I can say when, when kids go on from either, you know, a suburban area or an inner city area and they want to pursue agriculture and they take agriculture, oftentimes they kind of feel in those classes uh, like they're behind. And the reason they feel that way is because almost everybody else sitting in that class grew up on a farm. Right. And they are at a disadvantage. So when a professor, probably not meaning to, just says something that he expects most of the kids to know what it is, I, I had an intern that actually came to us because he wanted, before he went back, he wanted to experience a summer on the farm so he understood it. And he was like, oh, okay. Now, and he was just like everything, he was like constantly, that makes so much sense now. Oh, this makes sense now, you know. Um, they, they did an entire course on drones and he didn't understand why the drones were even necessary. Yeah. And then once he got to the farm, I said, well, here's one for you. We have 158,000 tomato plants out there. You can go look at each one <laughs> walking or you can fly the drone that's got forward looking infrared and look for things that are lighting up or anything you want to do. Um, it's up to you. Which do you think is the better way to go? So he learned how to fly a drone that day. That's awesome. Um, that is that, awesome. That's what made sense to him. And that technology, the technology, I mean, my 15 year old believes that he will be able to control the tractors from his phone at some point, which he probably will be able to. Yeah. Speaking of speaking of which, um, so how do we end hunger? What role is AgStem going to play in that? And since you guys have started protein production um, to to aid in getting food to people, um, how can we as an organization work with you all? to address this re really important issue of ending food deserts and you know getting food security to folks of color? So here's the thing. When people ask me about ending hunger, uh, the first thing I say is there is a solution to end hunger. It's the American farm. White, black, and brown, those farmers, we can do it. Um, we already have, technically. Because we have an, oh, we, we throw away more food in this country than we should be. At um, all, ever. No yeah. one should be hungry. We don't really have a hunger problem in the United States. We have a logistics it's a problem. a greed problem, too. Yeah. <laughs> well, just the basic logistics, you know, my grocery store, uh, we sold at under value. Um, that wasn't sustainable because. I mean, it just wasn't in, in the sense that we were small equipped print and we wanted to provide fresh produce, milk, eggs, basic meat. So we weren't trying to compete with Kroger or whoever to have every possible cut of meat or every type of, uh, of, of product. Um, but, and I, I had heard this like five or six times, people like, we need to teach the black community how to eat. That's bullshit. I mean, I'm, I'm not probably not supposed to say that. That's not that's not what I mean. Um, right. <laughs> you know how to eat. Um, I know that because I meet plenty of people who are concerned about the food they're consuming. Now, there is an issue that they seem to want to ignore, and that's that the store that was at 10th and Rule served people that were below the poverty level that were white, black, and brown. They were all making poor food decisions. They, it wasn't, 
based on a demographic or race. It was, I think it was more about making their food dollar go farther. Yeah. Um, and a bag of chips was preferred over, you know, a bag of oranges. Um, so we need to figure out how we can get food uh, that's accessible to people in those communities. Um, Cleo's Bodega is a really good example of how that's working. Um, but we need we need like fifty of them. <laughs> I mean, can you explain? Can you explain the setup for the, for the audience? What what's that? The bodega. Oh, Cleo's Cl yeah. Bodega. It, it's really. I mean, it, it's at twenty fourth and Martin Luther King. Uh, if you haven't been, you should go. They have a cafe. And, and it's a, it's an amazing cafe. Um, they, they, they do some, some sandwiches. They have really good coffee. But then they have a true bodega where they offer the basics. You know, you're not going to be able to go there and get, you know, a month's worth of grocery stuff. But you can sure as heck go there and get uh, maybe a week's worth. It, it, instead of having to go to a grocery store once a week, you know, a grocery store trip where you're loading up on something can be extended to that one time a month and Clio's and other places like it can fill in and do it affordably to where you're not spending, you're not, you're not paying convenience store prices. That's a huge issue with a lot of these small places is you're paying convenience store prices no matter where you go. And Clio's, you don't do that. You have the selection of fresh produce. You have, you have, you have a good selection of meat, chicken, beef, pork, um, and then the, the dairy and the eggs, it's there. And there is a selection of eggs there that are brown and organic and cage-free and all that stuff. But they also have the regular old white egg that you can buy that's, you know, I think $1.29 a part. So you think it's more about like having like smaller access points throughout the deserts for people to have like fresh food? So, so when I did the research, a, a good sized Kroger has a utility, a utility bill close to thirty some thousand dollars a month. Um, on top of that, they, they're, they're massive stores that have to be staffed. I do even now. I feel like the small footprint store is the store that will uh, be successful mm -hmm. as long. What, what really needs to happen is there needs to be some type of uh, centerpiece, or, well, I say centerpiece, like a food hub. And when I say food hub, I don't mean it in all these different types of food hubs. Yeah. We already have examples of food hubs. That, that, that's where I get, I get kind of, when, when people are like, well, we're going to create a food hub. Well, they are food hubs and they're very successful. They, they're just not called food hubs. They, they're, they're food distribution companies. If you would just mimic them, they've already done all the homework. They've already, they've already figured it out. If you mimic them and you do it to where the setting is to furnish small grocery stores, you win. But right now, the people who service small grocery stores are typically more high-end, holistic food places because the smaller grocery store stores tend to be catering to a certain clientele that wants 100% organic, that wants very odd, I, I say odd, I mean, I, I, I don't eat the, 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 the different things that, they're almost like small versions of Whole Foods. Those are successful. Yeah. And they're successful because everything's jacked up really high, the prices are really high. Um, but they have dedicated clientele that will drive from, you know, I know people that drive from Fishers to Broad Ripple to the, the holistic grocery store that's yeah. there. You know, that they're, they're getting outside help. Yeah. You know, if you have just a regular, hey, we, we just want, I mean, I don't hear anybody in these low income communities saying, well, we want Whole Foods. They're just saying, we want access to decent food. Yeah. You know, that's what they're asking for. Prices. With, with prices that, that make sense. I mean, you know, the gas station that was right next to us sold milk for four twenty nine a gallon, oh. and or in a but a bag of chips 
in there was, uh, I think, $1.99. And I mean, I'm talking about a big bag of chips. Uh, and then there's a whole issue with food labels that I feel like is kind of attacking both the, the, the black, the brown, and the low-income white communities. Um, there's this, so I had, I had a young African-American woman who came into our store because it was formerly Pogue's Room. She said, I love your prices on your organic produce, but it's still too expensive for me. I was like, oh, you know, well, we have conventional produce and it's priced, you know, I hope okay. She's like, well, I just, I've read too much. I, I, I'm, she actually said to me, she goes, I just paid, and, and she was low income, but she was scared to death. This was, she wasn't doing this out of, out of vanity or anything, because she, she's like, I just been reading, I watched this documentary, and then I watched this documentary. And she goes, I'm doing a glyphosate detox. I was like, okay. Um, and then she said, she said, so doing the glyphosate detox, I have to be very careful of certain things that I eat so it doesn't get my numbers back off. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, because, I, because I, I'm thinking literally, I was like, so do you work in a place where you're like getting bombarded with glyphosate? I mean, I'm a farmer and I don't do glyphosate detox. I use glyphosate. Because my liver, if, needs, if I need to detox, my liver typically takes care of that kind of stuff for me. And she actually migrated to where we had macaroni and cheese. And there was organic macaroni and cheese made, I forget that, Little Annie's or something like that, macaroni and cheese. And she bought that. It was $3.99 for a box of macaroni and cheese. And we were selling it, I think, at our cost. And I said, <laughs> I was just like, you're buying processed food over produce because you're worried about, you know, your health. And I said to her, I said, I'm a farmer. And let me explain to you the produce that you see right now, what I grow. And I, I told her about tomatoes and I told her about everything like that. I talked to her for an hour. When that hour was over, she had loaded her cart up with conventional produce. <laughs> yeah. And I just said, I just, I, I, I had to explain some things to her, but that, that was. I mean, that's part of what we hope that our partnership brings to, or our part brings to the table is like helping with that, like sort of communications piece and. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, uh, I, I can tell you as a farm advocate, I am, I am, a, I am a agricultural advocate. I advocate for agriculture. Um, something that we're facing right now in the ag world is ethical veganism. If you're familiar with that, yeah, ethical veganism. This is veganism that has no basis in health. It just has basis on you shouldn't eat animals. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually wrote a story about it. Um, but there's a black farmer that I know that's just south of Atlanta. And he, we were just sharing stories. And he told me how this white woman from the suburbs of, of, of Atlanta had came to explain to him how the entire African continent of African people are vegan. <laughs> and I was just sitting there thinking, and that dairy is definitely <laughs> explaining that because water is so scarce in Africa that they don't do dairy. And I mean, the Maasai <laughs> tribe is actually known for, they exist on dairy and they do it healthy. I mean, they're healthy, you know. Um, so that's something that. I've seen I've seen that more in the black community than I have in, in the white community. Um, as far as uh, you know, and when I say black community, I typically I, I am meaning I, I hate it that something that I personally don't like is that people will say black community, brown community, low income white community. I don't, I, I don't like that because I also know that there are 
black communities and brown communities that are not low income, but for some reason, nobody talks about them. Um, so I'm talking about maybe a, a, a class of people that I'm seeing right now, all the same in the same income brackets that are being bombarded with, you should be me. Um, you know, and personally, I, I, I think it's, I don't know if you've ever looked at vegan diets or if you've ever done it. <laughs> it's not cheap. It's not cheap. And, and honestly, that's part, that's part of why we, you know, partnered with you guys, because it's like, we do, we are a public health collective and we do want to promote like healthy nutrition eating. and healthy eating and all that other stuff. But we understand that people are hungry. They need their basic needs met before we start trying to tell them how to do health and wellness and everything else. They, need, they just need their, you know, all kinds of things like <laughs> I, I can't i can't tell somebody that that and i don't know what kind of arrogance it takes to tell someone who who is trying to make ends meet that if you buy you know a chicken to feed your family you know that you're you're doing you're you're, 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 you're harming you know you're harming something what i also don't like about that in general and in specific is that there's so many like cultural aspects to that as well um, that I think are invisible to those people because the rest of us don't have culture unless it's the kind that's up for grabs for costumes. But like, I definitely feel like in terms of um, like encouraging that kind of lifestyle, I mean, I often feel like, I think a lot of us often feel like that we're constantly like, see all of this animal rights and everything. And I, and I, I work in animal science, obviously I work in, you know, pet health. Um, so it's not like I, I don't have a, a, a really staunch like stance on animal welfare. Mm -hmm. um, I do, but you know, it feels like to me, and I think to a lot of people, black yeah. people especially, that no, exactly we, put, say. we put, you know what I'm going to say, that they put more value on those lives than they do on ours. Yeah. Well, of course they do. And you want me, you want me to have sympathy for for Harambe and and the dog and all this other stuff. We not, you don't even respect human life. So what are we talking about, vegan well, movements? Yeah. Right so now? We have the biggest problem I've had so far, where I, I can typically. You know, being a punk rock farmer, I can be very sarcastic with them. Uh, I had a professor share with me that he's taken clips of me arguing with vegans on Facebook. <laughs> them to his class. He goes, because this is how you need to argue with them. Don't argue science, because they don't care about science. But where I do yeah, get it's like, Until you start feeding children, don't talk to me about the dolphins. Period. Well, where I get bent on the shape is when... Uh, and I, I, I had, a, I had a, I had a vegan send me a thing that showed a silhouette of a. I'm assuming it was a black man, um, but it was a human silhouette, and they were hanging from a tree. They were lynched, mm. and underneath it, it said racism, 1888. I'm not sure where they came up with 1888, but it said racism, 1888. And then next to it, it showed a hog hanging from a hook and it said speciesism 2020. Honestly, that's I'm a going, perfectly apropos what? meme to me. To me, that makes a sense as a meme. <laughs> Period. Because that's that's that is what we are. Well just put us right up on the hook to them. Well obviously. I, and then, and then, then they use words like slavery without understanding slavery. Yeah. So what I will say to them is when they say slavery, I say so do you mean antebellum chattel slavery? Well, what, what, does, what does chattel slavery mean? I said it means absolute ownership, that yeah. the person has no... And, and that, like, that's well, the you, irony, right? We animals. used to be the animals. You used to breed us and feed us in pig troughs. Do you know what I mean? And now, like, you want us to, like, <laughs> be vegans? Well, I mean, vegan, then, let me, let me be clear. It, Veganism the, is fine. It's great. You know, congratulations if you're one. I'm just saying, like, I don't want to be preached to you about veganism when I know that you don't care enough about humans as you do about animals. Like, please, let me right. know well, when you start caring about humans. 
<laughs> all of a sudden. PETA actually, PETA actually did a thing where they actually showed uh, pictures of Auschwitz. Um, That's absurd. The Jews sitting in in the uh, in bunks um, and just showed them stacked, you know, super high. And then next to it, it showed chickens in cages. And I was just like, I don't, I don't know how to, to, as a farmer. You can't have, you can't have a rational conversation, you know, with someone who's, who's correlating the Holocaust of human beings, whether it be the African Holocaust or the Jewish Holocaust with human beings using animals as food. It just right. you can't have, that's well, a very difficult conversation to have. It's something that they don't understand. They don't understand. And they say, you know, if you work in animal science, an animal that's stressed out and mistreated is probably not great for market. You know? Right, yeah. As a farmer, the last thing I want is my animals being stressed out and... It's the same thing for research. You don't... You want, the, you want them to be calm and... and well cared for and and um have comfort because stress well, how, will, how stress more, will skew your research results you how know? many more years do these people get to protest farmers and scientists like yourself because of the research you've done with animals i mean i actually seen that some that they were holding up a thing that said stop animal testing now but the thing is is that then stop taking tylenol yeah you know what i'm yeah. saying then, then stop all of it because it doesn't mean that we don't have respect. I, whether it's kooky or whatever or not, like I literally, you know, I, I won't say I have like a makeshift memorial for every animal I had to euthanize, but I definitely thanked it for its service and, and you know, had respect for that, you know, process if I had to euthanize a mouse, right? right. So right. like we have respect for the animals, believe that. Like you know, they live much fuller lives than getting eaten by owls in the fields. You right. know, well, like, I mean, people don't understand that. Like when the truck comes to load up cattle, I'm nowhere to be found because I can't, I can't, I can't do that. It's just uh, now I'm going to eat those cows. You know, I'm going to eat one of them because we're going to keep one of them. But I still had a connection with them, and you know, I just don't want to see them go. But at the same time, as a farmer, I know what their purpose is. The day they're born on my farm or I bring them onto my farm, now I can't say that for hogs. I personally don't mind loading up hogs because I'm glad when they're gone. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, with cattle, it's just one of those things. But that, that's the relationship. And the one great thing I know is that while that cow was on my farm, they were never mistreated. They never wanted for anything. You know, yeah. and, 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 and the processor that I send them to has the same respect for the animals that I do, you know, and, and, and I know that, and I personally know him. And it's amazing how many farmers have that relationship with a processor. It's amazing how my father-in-law raised almost a thousand head of cattle. He treated them all, even though he had a vast number of them, he treated them very well. I mean, no farmer wants to see their animals suffer. Nobody wants to, you know, and and I think about, like, I think about, you know, that, that farmer that's south of Atlanta, you know, that's what he does. He does cattle and he does hogs. And to look at him and to see how successful, I mean, he is very successful. He is, I wish I was as, su as successful with ant raising, you know, livestock as he is. Um, he said the same thing though about produce with me, so we're we're kind of even. We'll, we'll, <laughs> for somebody to say to him, "Hey, you know what? You're no different than, than say what was done to your great great grandfather. Yeah. You're, you're doing the same thing." To, to to try to to try and to me that, that's just it's a, it's annoying because here's the thing: like as far as what we can tell from the euphemisms that we use in our society, the war of northern aggression, the transatlantic trade. It seems like most of them don't really understand what chattel slavery was. That means rape, torture, whipping, breeding, not just, and I mean breeding in the sense like animal, like husbandry, like breeding two people together to make more rigorous Negroes, right. right. 
nothing, no freedom, no, um, your babies were taken from you and sold at auction. I don't think people, they just think, oh, well, the Irish had it bad too. No, this is not, that's not what we're talking about. You know what I mean? Like no control over your existence whatsoever, period. Well, I mean, the, the, the lives, the lives and deaths of enslaved Negroes is nothing, nothing compared to, you know, what animals get. At all. Nobody them. tortures animals. Yeah. They, they have. I mean, it, nobody, come on. There's a level of respect that you have in treating animals that you work with that Black folk never had as no. the same beings. Period. Never. Well, and that, that's the thing. I mean, as, as, as a person. But it's just weird because, I mean, that's something that could get me, I mean, I know without a doubt that that's a, that's a saber rattling moment of if, if, if they were going to enslave another group of people, that's not something that I could live with, you know, knowing that that's happening. But the, what, what's funny is I have, there's a woman from, from, uh, from Kenya that I became friends with like pen pals and she wants me to come visit her farm. It's a very large farm, and she is very successful. Um, and her name is Elizabeth Wafulu. And she actually taught me a thing about, because I'll get frustrated with politics. And she goes, in Swahili, we have a saying that says that when the elephants fight, only the grass gets hurt. <laughs> and I thought that was funny, but I was talking to her, and I was like, so she was following the, the vegans kind of attacking my my." my my page and everything. I said, so what do the vegans do in Africa? She goes, oh, there's no vegans here. She goes, if they're vegans, I mean, I don't know any. And she goes, I raise cattle. I rate, she goes, and I'll tell you what, she, it got her, her ear up a little bit when people were saying, well, all the entire continent of Africa is vegan. Oh, not in Kenya, they're not, because Elizabeth let them know. And she started putting pictures of her cattle up and all the different things, and you know, and that's the other thing that 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 also bothers me is if you watch TV late at night and it shows African children with flies landing on them and they're emaciated, and I'm sure there are places in Africa like that. Yes, they found those pictures somewhere, but there's also an entire group of African farmers who are using the same equipment that I use, that are using the same animal husbandry practices that I use, that are, that are I mean, actually, they're, they're screening right now for uh, genetically engineered corn that's drop resistant. For whatever reason, the, the country of Kenya said that they would not allow genetically engineered corn, but all the farmers want it. Um, the banana plantations are being saved right now because of genetic engineering. And it's the African farmers who are embracing it, you know. Yet we have people here with first world problems that are like, make sure it's not GMO, you know. And where do they who do they think is growing this tropical produce? Do they think it all comes from the very southern tip of Florida? Because it doesn't. It comes from around the world. Yeah. And, you know, the reason why we still have mangoes is because of genetic engineering. Um, and the reason why those kind of things do happen there is because of women like very strong. I mean, you want to talk about a strong woman. Um, she, her husband died and she had to take over the farm and she did it. And I'm not talking about 20 acres. I mean, her farm is like 3000 acres. So she is not, yeah, she is not playing around. Um, oh my gosh. <laughs> it's interesting that you, you mentioned the, the late night TV shows that show these African children that are emaciated and whatnot. Because I think in this country, we're disconnected from the fact that there are people living in cities and towns and rural neighbor, you know, neighborhoods in this country that look just like that. And yeah. so, you know, I want to, we're, we're running over time and I want to end with, you know, part of our mission is to, you know, create a group of hood farmers that can do the work you know, the, the valiant work that you're doing with food aid, getting food to communities that have food deserts, getting food to communities who can't afford to have nutritious meals. Um, so we, we want to end by asking our audience, please support these efforts because part of public health 
isn't just making sure people have good doctors to go to or that people get treated well at medical facilities. Part of public health is making sure people have food to eat. Yes. Basic yeah. nutrition. So I want to give out your website, which is, sorry, let me find it again. Just www.brandywine. Brandywine, B-R-A-D-Y-Wine, <laughs> creekfarms.org. Um, please go to that website and donate to the cause uh, of food aid that Jonathan Lawler and his uh, wonderful wife are, you know, putting work into. And please also visit our, our website as well, www.hoodmedicine.org, uh, to help us with the efforts that we want to put forth through uh, to getting food equity uh, as an important issue in our community. Yeah, and thank you so much for joining us. We're so everybody needs happy. The, everybody needs to Google Henry Blair and just read about him so that people know who he Please. is. I posted um, I posted an article about him in our Facebook chat, so I'm hoping people will see that and and learn about him. Thank you for that. That was you offered so many jewels in this conversation. So I really want to thank you, and you know, to all of our guests who uh, are so all of our viewers who turned in. Um, to watch this, you know, please, 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 please check out Jonathan Lawler's farm. Um, please look up um, Henry, Bla I mean, uh, Mr. Blair and, you know, learn about <laughs> that you can help to, to solve these issues of food equity. Uh, I hope that we can get a whole bunch of seven, six, seven, eight year old kids to visit your farm, to learn about farming. And can to I just say real quick, we have, so we have a program this year called Farmer for a Day. Um, we haven't officially launched it on our website. Oh, cool. So the whole point is, yes, it costs money for people that can afford it, but I want people to know that if they buy, if they, if they are supporting kids that don't have the money to come and spend a day on the farm, and that day on the farm will include learning about the plants, They'll have what's known as our livestock encounter, where they will talk to a large animal vet um, and learn about, you know, the different thing about the. We actually have a dairy cow, and her name is Gertrude, and then we have a beef cow, who her name is Francine. They're both very good around people, so we're using them. Um, we have we'll have chickens as well as hogs for them to see and learn about. Uh, they will spend, you know, some break time cane fishing in our farm pond. They will go on a tractor ride. They will watch flown dr or drone flights and be able to fly the drone so that they learn from that. And they actually leave with a pack of produce that they pick. Um, and we're, the certain families are actually going to get a week's worth of produce when as well as eggs and meat uh, when, when they, they leave. So awesome. we're, we're super excited about that. <laughs> Jonathan, I just want to thank you again uh, on behalf of uh, Dr. Hudson and myself, DC and myself. I just, I can't tell you enough how much we appreciate you being a soldier in the fight for our freedom and our equity in this country uh, and all the work that you're doing. You know, I thank you so much. Uh, thank everybody for tuning in today to our Hood Med discussion. At Hood Medicine, we want to bring you trusted individuals to provide you with the facts and information to allow you to make the decisions necessary to keep you and your family safe. Um, please follow us on Facebook at Hood, um, Hood Medicine Initiative, all one word. Uh, Instagram and Twitter, we're Hood underscore medicine. And please uh, check out our website, hoodmedicine.org, where you can find all of our events, opportunities to donate, and contact us if you have any questions about anything uh, related to the work we're doing. Thank you again. Please stay safe, mask up, and get vaccinated. God bless, guys.